Okay, so I asked you to think about this idea of um, keeping the baseline the same, but increasing the size of an individual telescope in an array of telescopes. Um, so effectively here, you would be kind of increasing the collecting area of your telescope. You'd be intercepting more of the light coming down from the sky. Um, but the resolution would stay the same because you haven't changed B here, so your resolution would stay the same. But you would make your array more sensitive because you'd be collecting more of the light. Another way to think about this is that um, you are trying to create a telescope with a diameter B, but most of it is empty because you've, you're only collecting the light from a small fraction of this overall area that's covered by B here. So the more of that area you can cover, the more uh, light you're going to uh, collect. And so you'll be able to see fainter objects in the same time. Okay, let's move on. So the next thing I want to look at, so we've talked about the angular resolution of a particular telescope. So next, you know, what can we actually resolve with that angular resolution? So we need to be able to compare the angular resolution of our telescope with the angular size of the objects in the sky that we want to study. So how do we calculate or predict uh, the angular size of an object in the sky? Okay. Well, again, most astronomical ob objects are going to be an extremely long way away, and therefore the angle on the sky is going to be very small. So we can use a, uh, a trick here, which is to um, <clears throat> think about uh, the uh, angle subtended by an object on the sky as this very small angle of arc on a circle. Okay, So if we have an arc on a circle, that is of length L, and we divide by the uh, distance from the center of the circle, which is effectively the distance from us here on the Earth, um, D, then that angle theta in radians again is just going to be L over D. Okay. So, and again, if your angle on the sky is very small, the, uh, the length of the arc on the circle if the angle is very small, is no different to the sort of linear physical size of the object uh, on the sky to a very good approximation. Okay, uh, so you can think about this again another way. Okay, again, if you've got a circle uh, with a uh, radius d, sorry, excuse the confusing symbolism here. Um, your, if you had uh, a whole circle. Uh, then you would have 2 pi d divided by d, which would give you 2 pi radians, okay? So you recover uh, the, the angle here for the, for the full circle. But normally here, we're just talking about very, very small angles, uh, theta. And again, we would normally convert those uh, directly into arc seconds. So we would need to scale this, this number if L and d are in the same units. So again, if they were in meters, for instance, uh, if both L and D are in meters, then that would come out in radians. And then you would scale by this 206265 to give you arc seconds. Okay. So say we're trying to estimate the uh, angular size of an object on the sky, you know, whether it's a star or, or whatever. Um, if we had an estimate of how big we thought it was, the physical size L, we're going to need to know how far away it is uh, in order from, from the Earth. Uh, in order to work out um, this angular size. So <clears throat> how do we find the distance to anything in astronomy? Okay. So that's tricky uh, because everything is so far away um, that, you know, it, it can be very difficult to, to find the dis accurate distances to anything. So I'm going to tell you about uh, a particular technique, basically the only technique uh, that we can use that gives us the distance to a star or, or an object uh, directly. Um, and this is uh, a technique that uses the phenomena that is called parallax. 
Okay. Again, this is something that you experience in your everyday lives. Uh, this is illustrated in the picture below here. Uh, so just to define it, so parallax is the apparent change in the position of an object due to a change in viewpoint. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll have a go at doing this later in the, in the workshop. Um, but basically, if you, if you change your viewpoint and look from one side and then from another side, even if the thing in front of you uh, has not actually moved, it will appear to move relative to more distant objects in the background because your viewpoint is changing. Okay, so that is parallax. Again, those of you who've uh, been a, brought up through physics labs, you need to be careful of uh, parallax when you're trying to accurately read um, like a dial on a meter. You have to make sure that you, you look from directly above rather than from the side or the other side, otherwise you're going to get the wrong reading. Okay. Another example of parallax. Okay. So how is this going to help us? Well, um, the amount that an object appears to change in position for a given change in viewpoint um, varies depending on how far away uh, the object is. And so that is key to finding the distance. Okay. So what we're going to be looking at here in the context of stars and stellar parallax is that nearby stars appear to move relative to more distant background stars. And here we're now changing our viewpoint by the maximum amount we can actually do on the Earth. And that's by waiting six months for the Earth to orbit the sun. Okay, So because stars are so far away, we need to change our viewpoint by a lot, or we're not going to see any uh, effect of the parallax. So <clears throat> this little cartoon here illustrates this quite nicely. Okay, So here, the star is relatively nearby. And as we go around the Earth, you see that the star appears to move relative to the background. If you put it further away, the amplitude of that motion, the angle through which it moves over the year, is, is less. Okay, So here, you've got a big effect because the star is nearby. Put it twice as far away and the angle is halved. Okay. And these white dots here represent stars that are much, much, much further away, uh, way in the background here. Okay. So, so we're looking for this uh, motion, and this is not the star moving at all. If in the, it's not really moving. It's only appearing to move because of the orbital motion of our viewpoint here on of the Earth going around the sun. Okay, so we've changed our viewpoint um, by twice the Earth-Sun distance. Okay, which is referred to as one astronomical unit. Okay, so one AU is the radius of the Earth's orbit. Okay. Okay, so this leads us to uh, the definition of the parallax technique. So what we're trying to do is measure this uh, small angle here, which I'm calling P, so the angle of parallax. Um, and we can define that here in words. So the trigonometric parallax angle P of a star is half the angle through which a star appears to move relative to background stars due to the Earth's motion around the sun in six months. Okay. So here's the geometry again. So we've got the Earth at this distance of one astronomical unit from the sun. So that's just by definition. Okay, so that's uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. And here's the Earth going around the sun and this nearby star appearing to move relative to the background uh, stars by this angle P. So it will do some kind of motion, usually a, like an ellipse or something like that with some angle uh, P is half this angle here. Okay, So that's what we're trying to measure. And you can see then that we have a, this is why it's called trigonometric parallax, because we have a right angle triangle here, Okay, with one side of which we know the distance, we know the Earth's sun distance, 
is one astronomical unit. We're trying to find out this distance here, how far away is the star from the sun or the earth? It doesn't really matter because this angle is so small, but let's take it to be from the sun. Um, obviously the scale here is extremely exaggerated and most stars are much, much, much further away. Um, but from the, uh, if we can measure that angle and we know this distance, then we can work out uh, the, uh, the actual distance D here. And so this also brings us to the uh, unit in which we use in astronomy of the parsec. Okay, so how do we define the parsec? So the name comes from uh, shorthand for the full name really, which is parallax arc second. Okay, and that is shortened to parsec in terms of how we say this unit. And in terms of how it's written as a unit, it's abbreviated to PC, lowercase. So how is it defined? So the parsec is the distance uh, of a star that has a trigonometric parallax angle of one arc second. Okay. So if we just go back to our diagram. So if P is one arc second, and this is one AU, then this distance here, D, then becomes one parsec. Okay. So if your parallax is one arc second, your distance away is one parsec. And in the workshop this afternoon, we'll uh, use this definition to work out how many meters are in a parsec. Okay, but for now, we can uh, use this idea that the uh, further away a star is, the smaller this angle of parallax is going to be, and it just obeys this reciprocal relation. So once we've measured our parallax angle in arc seconds, all we need to do to work out the distance is just do one over that angle in arc seconds to give the distance in parsecs, okay? Because obviously if P is one arc second, then D is going to be one parsec in this formula. But if we, uh, if we measure a, an angle that's only half an arc second, so the parallax angle is smaller, the star must be further away, i.e. it would be two parsecs away, okay? So as an example, um, the nearest star, uh, which is Alpha Centauri, very bright star in the, in the Southern hemisphere, the nearest star to our sun is 1.3 parsecs away. And so therefore uh, has a parallax angle P of 0.77 arc seconds, one over 1.3. So you can see this is already smaller than one arc second. Um, and so thinking about um, what we talked about earlier, another one, another little thing for you to ponder uh, during the next five minute break is that, you know, we live in our galaxy, Milky Way, and uh, our galaxy is at least 20 kiloparsecs across, so 20,000 parsecs across. So have a think about what kind of accuracy you would need in parallax angle measurement if you wanted to measure the distances to stars all the way across the galaxy. So, you know, have a think about that. And then how difficult, given what we talked about earlier, is that going to be? Okay. So have a quick think about that and we'll be back in five minutes.